Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Thompson from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I hope you're all enjoying the virtual format of the course this year. And my lecture will be on lumen opposing metal stents, or LAMS, current practice. My disclosures are listed here. I'd like to start by discussing pancreatic fluid collections because this is the uh, approved indication for lumen opposing metal stents. And we'll cover some background in terminology, endoscopic techniques and outcomes, and how to select the best approach. And then we'll uh, cover alternative uses for LAMS. Pancreatic fluid collections are typically diagnosed on CT scan, and they are categorized by contrast enhanced computed tomography criteria. And we'll run through these uh, rather quickly. Uh, here we see something that everyone should be familiar with. We have a boggy, bright pancreas there, and this is interstitial pancreatitis. Uh, inflammation is typically uh, limited to the pancreatic parenchyma or immediately adjacent to this with some peripancreatic stranding. Uh, perfusion is preserved, and 85% of acute pancreatitis cases present uh, like this. Next, we have this CT scan. This is homogenous. Um, you don't really see a wall forming yet, and this is an acute peripancreatic uh, fluid collection. And again, homogenous fluid adjacent to the pancreas, confined by peripancreatic fascial planes, no recognizable wall. This typically occurs within the first four weeks of interstitial edematous acute pancreatitis, and if this remains sterile, most of these will resolve without intervention. We do not want to be placing a lumen opposing metal stent in this Necessarily, that's not what it's indicated for. You need to start seeing that nice wall. And here we have another homogenous fluid collection, but this time we do have a nice crisp a wall granulation tissue. And this is a pancreatic pseudocyst. Again, a well-circumscribed homogenous fluid collection, no solid components. Um, it occurs uh, typically only after interstitial edematous pancreatitis, and typically occurs more than four weeks after that initial event because you need time for the wall to form. And now this is variable. I've, I've seen it, you know, before three weeks in some uh, circumstances and 85% of this uh, do respond uh, to conservative management. Now, this would be a target for a lumen opposing metal stent if the person was symptomatic, if it was enlarging, et cetera. Um, you can also treat these with pigtail stents. All right, now here we have something more heterogeneous. We have a bright part of the pancreas, a darker part. We're not really seeing much fluid, certainly no wall. And this is an acute necrotic collection. The CECT criteria are listed there, heterogeneous, uh, varying uh, non-liquid density uh, components, uh, no encapsulated wall, as can be intrapancreatic and extrapancreatic. And uh, again, these darker areas represent non-viable necrotic pancreas, typically occurs you know, uh, within the first four weeks, and uh, you can see this, you know, four days into this. You would not be placing a lumen opposing metal stent into this or attempt to treat it endoscopically. And uh, finally, uh, here, is, here is what we like to treat. Uh, here we have some bright pancreas, some dark pancreas. We have fluid, and there's a nice wall around this. And this is, of course, walled off necrosis. And CECT criteria is there, heterogeneous liquid and non liquid densities well-defined wall, intrapancreatic, and or uh, extrapancreatic components to this. And uh, this is the mature phase of an acute, acute necrotic collection. So walled-off necrosis typically occurs three to four weeks after necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, it's, it is variable. Uh, and uh, the mortality rate is 12% if it's sterile and nearly 100% if it's infected and it goes untreated. But, you know, we do have several treatment options that we'll get into. Pancreatic fluid collections were originally treated using uh, pigtail stents. And you could either go down and use a needle knife to cut uh, through the gastric wall into the collection and then place your pigtails, or you could use endoscopic ultrasound. So here you see the needle knife, or you could use endoscopic ultrasound to put a, a needle into the collection, run a wire through that, you know, balloon dilate the tract up and put your pigtails in. And this was effective for pancreatic pseudocysts, not so much for necrosis as we'll see. And, uh, uh, really, it's a multi-step process that these lumen opposing metal stents have greatly simplified. So referring to pseudocysts, there was a retrospective single center study 
on, uh, on endoscopic drainage. And then the initial success using pigtails was 96%. And the uh, midterm results of six months was 82.9% of these patients with successful resolution. So you can use pigtail stents, but you can also use uh, lumen posing metal stents as well. Uh, it's a matter of preference. And uh, again, this is kind of more of a multi-step process, but the uh, pseudocysts do respond well to pigtails as well. Now we're getting to the original technique for uh, doing a necrosectomy. And here you see we place the needle into the necrotic collection. You see the necrosis here. We would pull off fluid. And then we replace that fluid with contrast and then place a wire, uh, again, through a 19-gauge needle. Then we'll move the needle and we'll balloon dilate. Typically, this is a staged approach with a couple of balloons ending up with a larger CRE balloon. And, uh, and then we will gain access to that cavity. And typically, you know, we'll drain this. And of course, you want the head of the bed up so they don't aspirate. We'll be aspirating this fluid out of the scope through the scope channel. And then we'll explore the, uh, the collection and, and then do some mechanical debridement. So, you know, these are the, the, the items that are required, EUS, fluoroscopy, CO2. You do not want to use air in these cases, as you can have emboli, very dangerous. And the person has to be under general anesthesia. The steps of the traditional approach to necrosectomy is a 19-gauge needle. You want to aspirate the fluid, inject contrast. With the original technique, you really needed to instill contrast to stretch out that capsule so you could get into it easy. You want a stiff wire. Again, a couple of different balloons, you know, starting off with a rigid six millimeter and then going to a larger uh, balloon. Uh, you want to change your scope over uh, to go out and breed and lavage and place some pigtail stents. So that's the original technique. Multiple steps, lots of uh, opportunity for things to go wrong there. Lumen opposing metal stents were, uh, you know, developed subsequently in Itui, uh, had the first publication on this in 2012 where he used these to treat pseudocysts. And it was a 15 patient retrospective series. There was 100% technical success. The median time to removal was 35 days and all pseudocysts resolved uh, after the single drainage procedure. And once uh, one stent did migrate into the stomach. And you can see, you know, lumen opposing metal stents, they kind of dumbbell shaped, uh, hollow, and there's a coating on there. Gornels in 2013 uh, described a uh, uh, his, his experience of nine patients, this was a prospective series, and the median procedure time you can see listed here was you know, very quick, about 25 minutes, and the success rate was 89%. And this was in different types of fluid collections. This was walled off necrosis as well as pseudocysts. So that was the early experience with the device. This is how it works, quite straightforward. You advance the device either over a wire or you can have an electrocardiogram or enhanced device you do not need to go over a wire with. And then you, you basically release that distal flange, very uh, straightforward, sort of like unsheathing a, a biliary stent, if you will. And then you would pull back the catheter and then release the more proximal flange. So it certainly does simplify this process um, kind of into one step. And then you can balloon dilate that and go through the stent to do some lavage if you want, or even early debridement. So the use of, of lumen opposing metal stents has certainly changed the, the method, of you, as you can see. We do not aspirate fluid out now, especially if we're not going to go in with a, a needle and a wire, and we're just using an electrocautery enhanced uh, design. Um, so we don't aspirate the fluid, which uh, it, I'm not sure it was very clinically relevant. However, we did always aspirate that and culture it. So sometimes you might adjust antibiotics based on that finding. Uh, again, there's no injection of contrast now because we don't have a needle in there in most of our cases. And that is uh, causing a little bit of a change too because traditionally, if we would inject contrast, we would often see if there was communication to the pancreatic duct. As you really start to stretch out the capsule and fill that cavity with contrast, the contrast will leak back into the pancreas if there's a, if there's a open fistula to the pancreas. And then you might want to put a stent in. Um, or it might, in this case, as you see in, in the, uh, the image here, go into the colon. And, you know, it was thought that, you know, opening up a large hole in the stomach while you have a, a fistula to the colon was not a good idea because you could end up with a gastrocolonic fistula. So that's some information we're not getting anymore using LAMS.
And then uh, a good thing is the degree of debridement is certainly a lot less using lambs because more gastric acid is getting through that larger caliber stent and it's really helping to, to clear up that necrotic tissue and, uh, and, and de debride it. And um, uh, it is seeming to lead to shorter dwell times and quicker resolution. What about uh, debridement itself, the process? Well, uh, here you see we're, uh, we're removing some necrotic tissue and we have quite a bleed there. Uh, and this is a larger blood vessel. That's a small feeding blood vessel on top of a large gastric ferrets actually. And we're trying to use hot biopsy forceps to cauterize this. This was before we had coli graspers. So there's lots of different complications you can run into when you're doing debridement. Um, and we used to debride more aggressively about a decade ago. Now we're using just a lot of lavage because we found the more you actually debride in the early setting, uh, the more likely you are to have complications. And here, of course, is uh, either an immature wall or a, uh, a wall that ruptured. Right there, you can see the opening, and that's the transverse colon. Some mental fat out there. And it's important to try to treat these again. When you have a bleed, you want to use coag raspers. It's not good to leave clips behind if you can help it, but in this case, we, uh, we did need to clip this closed. It was before we routinely would suture something like this. Probably better to suture this closed because in this case in particular, those clips, uh, a couple of years later, the cavity had scarred down so that those clips were pressing on the pancreatic duct, causing some problems. So again, if you can avoid leaving clips behind, that's better. So complications you can see include bleeding. And this can be right at the access site, which is easy to treat just by injecting epinephrine around it. Or it can be intracavity again, which we would use coag grasp to treat. Perforations can occur, or you can just have a, a wall that's not terribly well formed. And right now we're closing that, but you know maybe in the future we won't. We won't. We're looking for uh, you know more information, more studies on that. Air emboli very dangerous. We would only use CO2 doing this. Even if we're not going out, we would only use CO2 because air emboli are fatal and problematic. Sepsis of course can occur if that cavity is infected and you're you're uh, you know really stretching it out. With, with fluid or with, with CO2, you can have sepsis. Additional equipment to always have handy when doing a necrosectomy, listed there, epinephrine and an injection needle, various clips, um, coag graspers, and a suturing device uh, would be great to have as well. We are also seeing some new complications uh, uh, related to the use of lumen opposing metal stents. This is one here, which is a pseudoaneurysm and this forms from friction on the rough end of the stent here, kind of in, into those adjacent tissue planes where the blood vessels are, that, that occurs with respirations. And um, that's why it's very important to evaluate the patient in about three weeks, maybe do a CT scan or you can do EUS and see how much of a fluid collection remains. Oftentimes, these are so effective at getting gastric acid you know, out into that collection that the collection's already gone and you can just remove the stent. Uh, if there is still uh, a small amount of fluid in there, you can replace this with pigtails at that time. And if you are making any headway, it's a good opportunity to drive through the stent and do a necrosectomy and see maybe if you can leave it in longer. But again, uh, you have to be careful with that. Now, what about some data? So this is the first multi-center retrospective report on the direct endoscopic necrosectomy. Uh, it was six centers, 104 patients from 2003 to 2010. Initial debridement occurred 63 days after onset of pancreatitis. Successful resolution was seen in 91% of patients with a time to resolution of four months. There was a 14% complication rate. Three patients uh, did require surgery and there were five, five period procedural deaths. So um, substantial complications, but a good success rate uh, for a direct a necrosectomy where you actually drive out into that cavity and do some degree of mechanical debridement. Uh, Todd Barron at the Mayo Clinic uh, did a nice uh, study looking at uh, drainage versus uh, debridement. So he studied 45 patients and 25 had endoscopic necrosectomies and 20 had standard endoscopic drainage with pigtails. Um, this was retrospective. There's no difference in baseline patient or cavity characteristics and uh, no difference in the number of procedures. What he found was successful resolution was seen in 88% of patients undergoing the direct endoscopic necrosectomy and only 45% success rate in standard drainage. So um, clearly there was an advantage when you're using pigtails for drainage to going out and doing 
uh, debridement. Now, debridement thought to be superior to drainage. However, this is probably in flux and changing with the advent of these limb reposing little stents. We published a 60 patient prospective series um, uh, in a SCAMP format, looking at a different technique because that early report was a rather variable. Uh, there was uh, many different techniques. Some people were just using needle knives, needle knives to access the cavity. Others were using endoscopic ultrasound. There was a variety. So we used a, a single technique, EUS access, no needle knives, only using balloons um, and dilators. Fragmentation was preferred, fragmentation and lavage rather than actual debridement. Um, and uh, we did that in the first, the first procedure in over 98% of cases. And then all patients were taken off PPIs. So that was an important thing we wanted to be consistent with as well because we felt the acid would be very important in helping that, uh, that debridement process. We had an 86.7% success rate uh, with eight requiring percutaneous drainage and then four of those going on to surgery. 65% uh, required only one session, that very first session. Um, the average number of procedures was 1.4, and uh, the SAE rate was only 3.3% with a bleed and a perforation, both treated endoscopically, and there was no mortality. So really in, in cleaning up the technique and, 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 and uh, with, that, with that approach, we were able to really reduce those complications without losing much in the way of success. However, it was still a very complicated process, and it wasn't broadly adopted. Those are the high points there. What is, it, what is I think, important is, is definitely stopping those PPIs. So uh, there is now some data as well, looking at a comparison between metal and plastic stents. And this is a meta-analysis looking at 41, uh, 41 studies and over 2,200 patients. Uh, over 1,200 had plastic stents and uh, over 1,000 had metal stents. There's a variety of metal stents here. Um, you have over 870 lambs there. Um, and there's a variety there as well. So results, uh, resolution was more likely with the metal stents than the plastic stents. And uh, resolution with a single endoscopic procedure was similar between the two groups at 47 and 44%. Metal stents uh, were associated with lower bleeding rates. And this is quite interesting, but I, th I think that uh, what you were seeing is many people ran into bleeding when they were Again, accessing the cavity, maybe potentially with a needle knife or other technique. And uh, the lamb stent actually helps tamponade that. So that would reduce that initial bleeding, even though we already talked about there's perhaps a slightly higher bleeding rate uh, later, you know, if you leave the stent in for a month or so. And there's a trend towards lower perforation and stent occlusion rates, uh, although with higher migration. So metal was uh, thought to be better than plastic. Uh, in this in this report as well as a few others. Okay, what about other options other than endoscopic options? Well, percutaneous catheter drainage has been used and certainly does have a role. This was a systematic uh, review of the literature, looking at seven or sorry, eleven studies with over three hundred and eighty patients and only one RCT in this group. Seventy percent of these patients did have infected necrosis. Traditional approach used here with fourteen French drains and they were flushed every eight hours, and this led to success in 55.7% of patients. However, there were a lot of complications. 21% uh, of patients had issues. Uh, pancre pancreatico cutaneous fistula were rather common. Uh, uh, pancreatico enteric fistula, bleeding, colonic perforations, uh, and a, a mortality rate of 17.4%. These aren't necessarily apples to apples comparisons with the endoscopic approach because these patients, you know, are quite conceivably sicker. Uh, they don't have walled off collections, but uh, this is the data. What about surgical necrosectomy? Well, here is a large retrospective review looking at 88 patients. 47 had a minimally invasive approach and 41 uh, of these patients had an open approach. And medium time to surgery here was 31 days from onset of pancreatitis. So if you remember those early reports from the endoscopic group, it was almost twice as long as in the 60s. So again, probably not apples to apples. Um, 92% of these patients had post-operative complications. That's what's quite striking. Endocrine insufficiency, exocrine insufficiency, fistula, biliary strictures, et cetera. And 28% uh, mortality rate. So here we go, moving on to uh, a randomized control trial. So comparing these techniques, in particular, surgery and endoscopy. 
So they used a composite clinical endpoint um, of, of major complications, new onset organ failure, new onset diabetes, and death. And uh, there were four hospitals involved. This occurred from 2008 to 2010. 22 subjects enrolled. And you can see here that uh, all of the, the, the surgical patients did much poorer on, these, on this composite clinical endpoint than the endoscopic group did. So uh, this study really was uh, the one that showed that you know, endoscopic treatment of wall-up necrosis was truly the gold standard. Okay, so how about comparing the endoscopic approach with percutaneous drainage? So that's a popular, uh, a popular intermediate step, a part of the step-up approach. You know, you could do drainage, see if it works because it's less invasive. If it, if it doesn't work, you can then go on to something uh, more invasive such as surgery. Um, well, some people also view endoscopy as part of a, a different step-up approach where you do endoscopy and then if that doesn't work, you go on to surgery as well. So what about comparing these? two arms, a traditional step-up approach versus endoscopy. So we performed a, uh, a uh, retrospective matched cohort study based on uh, Charleston comorbidity index. And you can see here a success rate of initial DEN or endoscopic approach was 11 out of the 12 matched patients versus the step-up with percutaneous drainage, which is only three of the 12. Uh, so that's significant. Complication rates were much lower in the endoscopic group as well, one in 12 versus eight in 12. We have other outcomes here. Uh, the endoscopic approach resulted in less new antibiotic use, pulmonary failure, endocrine insufficiency, shorter ICU stays, and uh, uh, shorter length of stay overall. The healthcare utilization was also lower for the endoscopic approach uh, by a factor of 5.2 to 1. And you can see the total charges there are 54,000 for the endoscopic approach versus 283,000 for, uh, for the PCD group. So clearly, if the patient is eligible for endoscopic drainage as all of these patients were even in the percutaneous group, it's just better to have them undergo endoscopy. So again, that leads us into selecting the best, best approach. We have several options to choose from, and the things we're gonna be thinking about here are maturity of the, of, the, uh, of the collection, location of the collection, and then a few other things as well. So regarding maturity, um, you know, wall integrity is very important. And here you see, again, we have fluid. However, we don't have a, a, a well-defined wall here. So this would be a, a better case for percutaneous drainage. It's just not ready for an endoscopic approach. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is an example of, of a collection that, again, would be uh, good for endoscopy. You have a nice wall and you still have that nice fluid component there. A solid to liquid ratio is also very important. You know, the endoscopic approach is better the, the more liquid there is. So, uh, you know, if you can wait and, and it's safe, it's, it's better to do that. And the uh, FDA uh, indication for using a lamb is a lamb's uh, stent is less than 30% solid necrosis. So keep that in mind as far as being on label, if you will. Uh, location is also very important. So here, if you have a collection that's too far away from the stomach, again, you want to be about a, a centimeter uh, within a centimeter of the stomach or now with the longer saddle uh, lamb stents, uh, you can be, you know, 15 millimeters away from the stomach. But if it's too far, you know, you really, it's not safe to go out and grab that and try to pull it up. A lot of times it's under tension that can cause problems. So proximity to the gastric wall is important. Uh, you can also do a transduodenal approach. I prefer not to do that with lambs. I think you make a rather large defect there, and you are likely to have a resulting fistula. And then you're also thinking about some other factors, including you know extension into the pericolic gutters, which does not seem to resolve very well. I think these patients are better suited with surgery, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I, I, I did this procedure and it took a very long time for it to heal. Even when you can get access through the stomach and get gastric acid out there and you run the big pigtails down to the gutters, it still takes a long time for these patients to heal and they're not necessarily the best endoscopic candidates. Um, again, patients with colonic fistula, it's not clear that those people are going to do well um, and you don't want to end up with a gastrocolonic fistula. Again, maybe consider surgery. And patients with gastric varices are. Uh, well suited to an endoscopic approach because we can see those vessels on EUS before we uh, gain access. So that uh, wraps up the pancreatic fluid collection portion of the talk. Moving on to off-label uses, um, we see the list here, stenting luminal strictures, palliative GJ anastomoses or gastric 
Enteral anastomosis is really what we're doing there. Gate or edge procedures, which are just ways of dealing with rheumagastric bypass anatomy. Cholecystoduodenostomy and cholecystoduodenostomies. Starting with benign luminal stenosis. So this is a systematic review of 12 studies, uh, including 70 patients. And uh, uh, these are all benign luminal stenosis. You can see in the, in the video how this works. You basically use the, um, the delivery system through a large channel upper endoscope, a double channel upper endoscope, something like that. And uh, you can place this over a wire to be safe, but no endoscopic ultrasound needed. And just deploy the distal flange on one side of the stenosis and the proximal flange on the other. It's quite straightforward. Results here, again, they, they use this in a variety of, of areas, whether it's a GJ stenosis, a esophageal stenosis, a colonic stenosis, et cetera. Uh, several anastomotic lesions as well. And 94.2% of these strictures in this, in this report were refractory. They'd been uh, treated multiple different ways and it wasn't successful. Technical success using LAMS uh, was 98.6%. Uh, the composite clinical success score, which was looking at symptoms, and again, these are different, these are looking in different areas, so it was a, uh, a, a constellation of different symptoms depending on where the stenosis was. And this success rate was 79.7% uh, or 55 out of 69 subjects. Uh, it was 100% successful in treatment naive patients and 78.5% successful in those refractory strictures. Overall failure rate was 21%. Complications for this included stent migration, 7.1%, abdominal pain and 5.7%, bleeding, new uh, proximal strictures related to the flange, uh, perforation 1.4%, and then deaths in 4.3%, but none of those were uh, deemed to be due to LAMS. Palliative GJ anastomoses or gastroenteric anastomoses, all sorts of reasons to do this. We've all had these patients where you just keep layering more and more metal stents in that duodenum and in the bile duct, and it's just, it just destroys any uh, motility that was there, and it really makes it hard for the stomach to push food through this complex. This uh, gastroenterostomy was first reported in Japan. Uh, numerous methods have been described. This is one that was popularized there where you actually can place this kind of double balloon catheter uh, you know, through the area of stenosis, which again, you have to get these patients early if you want to use this technique. And then the, this uh, uh, chamber between the two balloons is filled with contrast and maybe some methylene blue, and then it gives you a nice target for US. There's also a freehand technique, uh, which I'll discuss uh, in this video. So this is one of our first publications on it in 2006 using a freehand technique. And uh, you can see here, it's a good example of why I don't like using a needle and a wire. We used the needle and we used a wire and then we deployed that stent too proximally and you can see some mental fat right here. So we were in the peritoneum with that procedure. We didn't access the loop of bowel we were trying to access and we found a few things out that were important. Uh, number one, you don't want to use a needle and a wire because as you're pushing the wire into the small bowel, you're actually pushing the small bowel away from the stomach as well. And that is not advisable. It makes it a little more difficult actually. So uh, additionally, you want to use pure cutting current. There's other steps we like, to, we like to use. We like to give glucagon, give 600 cc's of contrast. You can mix methylene blue or not. Um, really just end up the bowel. We, we, we do some positioning things as well. And I think that really has enhanced the procedure. So back to this case, we enacted uh, those steps and went in with a freehand technique with no needle, no wire. We grabbed the bowel and pulled it up nicely and then remove the, the prior stent. So if you do this, just kind of stick with it. You know, we put, put some clips in there to mark it because when you remove the stent, sometimes it's hard to find it again in that site, and then we close the patient quite well. This is a report from, uh, from our center. Uh, retrospective review of 100 patients with malignant gastric outlet obstruction. 78 of these patients underwent uncovered self-expanding metal stent placement. Uh, and... Uh, uh, 22 uh, subjects underwent LAMS placement. And uh, you can see here the average age, uh, technical success was 100% in both groups. Clinical success rate, 69% in the uh, enteral stent group and 91% in the LAMS group. So they tended to do better clinically with the lumen opposing metal stent. Repeat intervention was much lower, 8% in the LAMS group versus 31% in the enteral stent group. Adverse event rate, 
about half in the LAMS group, 20% versus 40% in the general stent group, and then in growth, 16.5% in the general stent group and 4.2% in the LAMS group, and that's published in surgical endoscopy. That's just the, the numbers there. What about the edge procedure or the gate procedure? Okay, this is for gaining access to the remnant stomach in patients with a history of renal gastric bypass. Well, there's different ways to get into that remnant stomach. One, you can go all the way around with a, with a, with a balloon enteroscopy system uh, and then do a peg tube into it. You can have IR try to do a peg tube into it and dilate that up. And then you can kind of maybe put a trocar into it or uh, an esophageal stent. And that's, you can gain access that way and do whatever you need to do in ERCP or whatnot. Or you can use a lumen opposing metal stent as seen in the right hand video here, um, where you basically, you can put a needle into the remnant stomach and just fill it full of fluid so you can see that. And then uh, you, you created a nice target there. And then you can go from the pouch uh, into that remnant stomach uh, with, with a lumen opposing metal stent. So the two kind of, kind of contrasting ways of doing this. So uh, we call this procedure gate in our institution, gastric access temporary for endoscopy because we do obviously form far more than just ERCP through that access point. Uh, we've done ESD, EOS, and other procedures as well. So uh, we studied eight patients, um, and the technical success of gate in those first eight patients was 100%. Um, and five of these, actually, we went from the jejunum to the remnant, and three we went from the, the stomach to the remnant, and that was certainly more um, stable than going with that approach. Uh, success rate at performing foregut procedures via gate was 100%. Uh, six ERCPs, one EUS, and ERCP, one ESD with suturing uh, in the duodenum. Uh, gate closure was confirmed in 100% of cases, uh, and uh, the adverse event weight was 25%. Uh, one was access related bleeding and the other uh, two were interprocedural lambs migrations. And that really tends to happen when you, know, you go through the lambs in the same setting and it is on the jejunal side. If it goes from jejunum to remnant, that's a higher risk right there. Uh, there's more angulation, the, the tissue uh, isn't as strong in holding on to that um, more proximal flange. So that, that's something we, we now avoid. Moving on to cholecystoduodenostomy. Um, this was one of the early applications for this. And, uh, you know, percutaneous drainage is certainly effective for the treatment of acute cholecystitis, uh, especially in, in the inoperable patient. And success rates uh, do vary from, from 56 to 100%. Complication rates about 12% with pneumoperitoneum bleeding and bowel peritonitis, uh, you know, happening uh, not infrequently, but catheter dislodgement certainly being the, the, main, the main problem there. So what about some data? Uh, this is a systematic review of patients with acute cholecystitis treated with endoscopic drainage. And uh, the video actually is a, one of the original videos of the first procedures performed by Professor Moon. Uh, and you'll see he, he places the lambs into the gallbladder and then we'll drive out and you'll see that characteristic mucosal lining. And so the, uh, the systematic review included eight studies and 12 case reports for a total of 155 patients. A variety of devices and approaches were used for this endoscopic uh, drainage. Technical success was seen 97.45% of patients, clinical success in 99% of patients, and adverse events in less than 8% of patients. So clearly this is a great, um, a great approach for the treatment of acute cholecystitis that really is an optimal. And finally, uh, cholecystoduodenostomy. And EUS certainly can provide different types of access. We can do rendezvous, we can do direct access procedures at all sorts of points of access into the pancreas as well as into the, the biliary system here, as you can see in the schematic. Um, and you know, we're getting certainly better at doing this. And here we see an EUS where we're placing a needle into the bile duct, filling that biliary system with contrast, and then we'll be able to put a wire into that and then advance a stent or um, you know, or advance a lumen opposing metal stent if the duct is big enough. Advantages there are that it really does hold on to that bile duct well and isn't going to migrate. Disadvantages are subsyndrome. You have a big opening there, especially if you're going from the duodenal bulb or, or even, you know, just above the, the pylorus, you really are a setup there for a subsyndrome. So I think it's very important if you're going to use one of these stents that you also consider placing a, a double pigtail through it to help 
minimize the chances of that. So here's a report uh, from surgical anoscopy in 2016, 57 patients who underwent US guided uh, cholidoco duodenostomy after unsuccessful ERCP, and these were all done using LAMS. Uh, the ERCP failure was due to duodenal obstruction in 72% in uh, of patients and inability to cannulate in the remainder. Results, uh, technical success was seen in 98% of patients, clinical success in 90, uh, just ni about 95%, and complication rate of only 7% with two duodenal, duodenal pers, one bleeding event, and one transient cholangitis. In conclusion, LAMs have become standard of care for the treatment of walled off necrosis, and if that collection is adjacent to the stomach and is walled off, uh, they, they certainly are the way to go. Uh, new applications of LAMs are in evolution, and early results are encouraging, and more studies are now needed to better clarify the role of these emerging techniques. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.